two. Um, thank you for coming both uh, in person and on Zoom to uh, this special session that is uh, uh, a guest lecture of Dr. Vadim Putsu, but also uh, part of a course on the history of Jewish mysticism that I'm teaching this semester. So uh, we have a bit of a mixed group today. Um, but uh, I will simply uh, share with you a few words about our speaker today, our guests, and then uh, give him the floor and make sure that everything is working here on the Zoom and with the PowerPoint. But okay, so Vadim Putsu is an associate professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Missouri State University. He studied philosophy at the University of Turin, cultural sciences at the Fondazione Collegio, Collegio si? eh, San Carlo, Modena, comparative history of religions at the U University of Lausanne, and received his PhD in Jewish thought from the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Cincinnati, Ohio. Dr. Putsu has held visiting appointments at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Franklin and Marshall College. I think that's in Philadelphia, no? Uh, close. close, Lancaster. Lancaster. The University of Turin and the Haifa Center for Mediterranean History, always saving the best for last in these biographies. He is the author of various studies on Shabtai Donolo, including the monograph Shabtai Donolo, a Jewish sage in medieval Byzantine Apulia, and also has published essays on wine in Jewish mysticism, on Jewish amulets and spiritual alphabets, and on, on, and on mystical techniques and altered states of consciousness in medieval Kabbalah. His most recent research focuses on the 19th century esoteric Platonist Thomas More Johnson. And today, as you know, we have a lecture uh, that will emphasize uh, the place of wine in the early modern Kabbalah associated with the Galilean town of Tzfat, Safed. Um, for my class, this is a, we almost managed to pull this off uh, so that I could give you I, uh, the introduction to Tzfat <laughs> before the lecture. And then thanks to Magda, I realized that I had it backwards and actually you're getting this lecture and then we'll go back to the classroom and have our proper introduction so that you can retroactively uh, understand the lecture. Um, but you know, I don't think it's you know, he doesn't, Vadim is confident that you'll understand. So I'm gonna share the screen and uh, hopefully you'll be able to see Vadim as well, and uh, I think that I think that you're set up. And thank you. All right. Can you minimize the oh for us, I suppose. Yeah, I can do that. Um, yeah. Okay. Something yeah. like that. Okay. All right. I don't see myself, but it's fine. And um, can can you all hear me? Okay. Can I assume that people? Um, online can also hear me and uh, okay very well so um, good afternoon everyone and uh, thank you very much for um, being here today thanks to Professor Hayes for inviting me for the Haifa Center the Haifa Center for Mediterranean History especially Prof Professor Gil Gambash and Professor Tzul Shalev and uh, Mrs. Shiri Barnhart for having me, for hosting me in Haifa for this uh, month. And um, I, I want to share something about my uh, research with you today, a research that I started uh, many years ago and then uh, you know set aside to do other things and then I'm, I'm sort of picking up again. Um, the... Um, I've been told that, that uh, it would be useful to um, begin with something about how I got there. And so I was in my early 30s. I had to decide a topic for my doctoral dissertation. And uh, I was studying Jewish philosophy and Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism. And so I obviously wanted to write something in the field of Kabbalah. And then knowing that I would have to devote, uh, you know, a certain number of years 
and, and energies to that, I was thinking about some other big passion of mine uh, at the time. And uh, obviously, as somebody who was born and raised in a wine region in Italy, in Piedmont, in the Northwest, home of some of the best red wines in the world. Is there a region in Italy that doesn't consider itself uh, more important winemaking? Uh, yes, there are a few uh, okay. where where an Italian would tell you, well, the wine's not that uh, good. Okay. Right. Okay. It's not that they don't have it. It's not right. as good. Right. Okay. Anyway, but uh, wine was another big passion of mine. I was trained as a wine taster, as a matter of fact. Oh. And uh, so I thought, hey, uh, you know, basketball would have also been an option, but, but putting together basketball and Kabbalah, I haven't quite figured it out yet. Um, so, bottom line, my initial, let me see, okay, my initial big questions for my research work were the following, very simple, how does wine feature in Kabbalistic practices, right? Uh, which is to say, what kind of role does it have if it does at all, in rituals, in mystical techniques, in magical operations. And the second question is simply, how is wine used in Kabbalistic speculation, right? Um, which is to say, when you look at Kabbalistic works, how is it, uh, you know, what, what, what does it do there? How does it serve as a literary trope or like a metaphor, a symbol, and, and, and we'll come back to it. Okay. Um, as it turned out, sorry, I'll go back to this. Uh, as it turned out, I found out very quickly that there were basically no studies uh, when I started about 10 years ago that put wine and Kabbalah together. Uh, and uh, you could say, well, maybe there were no studies because just no such topic. I mean, it's simply not interesting. It's not relevant. There's nothing written about it. Um, but in fact, that is not the case. As I started kind of uh, pouring over the topic, um, I realized very quickly that in fact, wine has been very important in many realms of Jewish life from at least the times of the ancient Israelites until at least the early modern period. Um, so in ritual, for example, right, when you have from sacrificial offerings of the ancient Israelites, or, or even before the temple, to regular liturgy, as in the Sabbath, at the beginning and the end, to yearly festivals like Purim, Pesach, uh, to Bishvat, where uh, wine is, um, is mandatory. Uh, to life cycle events, weddings, circumcision, um, where wine is used. And uh, interestingly, uh, wine features in those rituals always as a sort of a, a marking the transition between, uh, between opposites, between different status or different times and that kind of stuff. But we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, Wine was also something that um, ancient and medieval and modern Jews uh, dealt with as an occupation, uh, particularly in production and trade. And so beyond uh, the usual suspects, you know, like Rashi, who also had vineyards and all that kind of stuff, um, because of the very peculiar regulations that uh, making kosher wine, that, are, that surround making kosher wine, which is wine fit for consumption and also for ritual use for Jews. You just let that click admit on the screen. Yes. Now, because of that, especially when we're looking at small communities in the medieval Mediterranean, um, at some point in time, right, the time of the harvest, uh, winemaking had to be a business that involved the entire community, including women and, and children, because basically nobody who was not Jewish could take part in it. 
Um, but beyond that, so beyond involvement in ritual and in occupation, uh, we have also to keep in mind that uh, um, up until the early modern times, um, wine was an important part of the diet, simply food. And it was safe food. It was, it's of course, part of the Mediterranean triad, right? But uh, back in the days, it was also the most common drink uh, in the Mediterranean and beyond. What's the Mediterranean triad? Uh, wheat, barley, and, uh, uh, sorry, wheat, olive, olive, and wine. Yes. Um, so as I was saying, the, the, um, it was the most common drink, both in the Mediterranean and beyond, for the very simple reason that water was not safe to drink. And um, um, in addition, of course, it provides calories. It, uh, as I said, it, it sanitizes the water and uh, it's considered to be a good, an important component of the diet, both for, um, again, uh, also for healthy, for dietary reasons. In fact, and this is the last point, uh, wine was considered to be part of a healthy diet, uh, in part because of the uh, theory of humors, right? The, 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 the medical theory that was um, a common currency up until, again, essentially the early modern period. And so wine could help achieve a balanced diet. Um, it was supposed to, it was thought to act on blood in part because of the similarity between the two liquids and uh, to serve essentially as an agent more than anything else for active ingredients in medicine, right? It wasn't necessarily wine per se that had medical um, uh, qualities, but whatever you would have to take as part of a drug would go into the wine and the wine would, would, would help. Um, convey that self. And in general was thought of as an aphrodisiac, but also as an anesthetic, as a digestive, and so on and so forth. So when we put all of those things together, which is to say that prominent role of wine in pre-modern Jewish history and beyond and Jewish life, uh, it shouldn't surprise us that it was also it also featured prominently as a symbol. And by symbol here, I mean two things. I mean a symbol both as a marker of identity, okay? Uh, something that you can, that, that kind of signals who you are as opposed to somebody else. Uh, and we have examples of serving as a marker of a socio-religious identity. For example, we have prohibitions um, since the time of the ancient Israelites of, uh, against kings or against priests uh, taking wine before they have to perform their, um, their office, uh, judging or, or serving in a temple and so on and so forth. And so that marks the difference between them and the rest of the people. Uh, but also, and this is true even today, uh, um, it marks a difference between a pious and or observant and secular Jews, right? You cannot enter now in a, in a wine production facility here that makes kosher wine here in Israel if you're not a, a, a Sabbath of servant Jew. So, you know, most, of, most people can't basically. Um, and of course, also, it has served over time as a sort of a marker of ethno-religious identities, is essentially differentiating, uh, differentiating between sort of us and them, um, Jews and non-Jews oftentimes, right? Um, for, we, we can go back to that, but that's not as important right now. The second sense in which we can think of as wine as a symbol as again, as part of a sort of a literary metaphor. And there too, interestingly, we have, since the first attestation in the Bible, um, both positive and negative images associated with wine. So on the one hand, it serves as a metaphor 
for prosperity, divine favor, uh, beauty, fertility, love, learning, wisdom. Okay, but on the other hand, the same text would use wine as a metaphor for uh, dissolution, for uh, upsetting of regular balances, uh, for boundary breaking, for transgression, for sin. Okay. So when you put all of these things together, which is to say all of these roles that wine served in pre-modern Jewish history and Jewish life, then you can come to formulate what I like to call a sort of a cultural enology of Judaism or a Jewish cultural enology, which is to say the hypothesis or the idea that in the pre-modern period, attitudes toward wine provide a smaller scale reflection of ideological and existential postures maintained by a Jewish individual or a social group. And if this is true, okay, if this is true, then investigating, studying attitudes and uses and representations of wine may contribute to elucidating more fundamental elements in the mentalities of the authors on the scrutiny, which is to say you can use what people wrote and thought and did with wine as a window into what they thought and believed about much bigger things, much larger things, okay? Um, without necessarily formulating fully this theory, some scholars have kind of worked with that same hypothesis in the background. And, and the one example that I, that, uh, that, that I should bring here is the work of Chaim Soloveitchik in the field of al who was basically using, again, uh, medieval legal regulations about wine to study the mentality of medieval Ashkenazi Jews, okay? So what, what he did with essentially legal sources I'm doing with Kabbalistic sources, fundamentally, okay? Okay, so when we get to Alaha, uh, to, sorry, to Kabbalah, wine appears often as a symbol. And so studying the symbolism of wine allows us to study a number of much larger ideas that have to do with Kabbalah. So uh, first of all, it allows to study the nature and uh, function of Kabbalistic symbols, right? And uh, I should note that uh, my understanding is that, uh, you know, if you're in this course, you have some, uh, some, some smattering of, uh, of, uh, of Kabbalistic principles. So you know that uh, one of the kind of the pivotal ideas of Kabbalah is the existence of a, uh, a, a system of sefirot or divine attributes or divine vessels or divine instruments. And wine uh, corresponds typically to one in particular, gvura or din, divine judgment, but these are sometimes associated with two other sefirot, one higher, bina, and one lower, Malchut or Shechina. Um, but more specifically, as I, was, as I wanted to say, wine as a Kabbalistic symbol is characterized by ambivalence, by dichotomies, and by the possibility of flipping between opposites, right? You have all of these dual dichotomous distinctions, but wine also represents a possibility of, of kind of going from one to the next, uh, in, in just a moment. And so you encounter Kabbalistic discourse about wine um, that, that, uh, that oftentimes, um, oftentimes moves beyond some of the dichotomies that I have listed here. For example, wine that is gladdening versus wine that is intoxicating, or 
wine that is preserved, that is to say, has not been touched by non-Jews, and that is kosher, versus wine that is libated, is offered as a sacrifice to idols. Or mixed wine, wine mixed with water, uh, versus pure wine. And, uh, and sometimes just based on the color, wine that is light, white versus dark red. All of those dichotomies have values that are attached to them. There's always like a positive pole and a negative pole to them. And so, as I said, all of these tensions are the result, I believe, and I'm not the only one who believes that, uh, are a result of the tension inherent in the production and the effects of wine between control and lack of control. We have a certain amount, wine in a sense is part nature and part culture, and so there's a certain amount of control that we have over its production and over its effects on us. But then there's also, on the other hand, a certain amount of lack of control. Uh, you know, it can go sour, and especially back in the days, it easily go sour, and we can also get drunk before we realize it. Okay, depending on our weight, our gender, our, you know, how much we ate, there's a lot of things. And so, because of this sort of ambivalence, of this tension that is built into wine itself, as a symbol, it also works all the time with this kind of ambivalence, with these dichotomies. Uh, as I was saying, wine in Kabbalistic terms, in Kabbalistic symbology, corresponds to Sfirah Gvura, but also Binan Mahut. Uh, so interestingly, it also represents the feminine, right? If you, if you know anything about the Sfirot, you also know that they are gender, right? There's, there's feminine side and the masculine side, and all of the Sfirot connected with wine are feminine. Mm -hmm. So it serves also as a representation for the feminine and is connected to discourses about the other, right? The Kabbalist is always a male, and so it's the other. It can be the sexual other or the religious other to divine power and to the human interaction with it, the origin of evil and the state of our world. Uh, let me give you just a, a brief example before we go into the meat of things, right? Um, pure wine is um, considered to be um, associated with the, with the uh, of divine judgment, so with the feminine. And so a number of Kabbalistic texts, uh, medieval and also early modern ones, for example, uh, put a negative label on pure wine and a positive label when wine is mixed with water. Why? Because water represents chesed, which is a masculine sphere, which balances out the feminine. Okay, so you have, you have that sort of representation right there. In addition, to all of these symbolic association between wines, firot, and other items, already in rabbinic literature, wine is connected to other items. Yes, you had a question. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can choose not to answer it now, um, but it, in the, you mentioned before that wine was a safe beverage to drink and water mm -hmm. wasn't, and now you mentioned something about uh, soup, of the wine and water. Mm -hmm. And I've seen also rabbinic sources that say, you know, that, the, that, it, that in the former times, the wine was much stronger and therefore it had to be diluted It's rhetoric. Water. That's, like, it doesn't make any sense. It's rhetoric. So, it's, okay. Yeah. So what's the story so with that? Okay, a couple of answers at the end if you want. Okay, to well, you off track. it's uh, so 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 the thing about the mixed wine versus the pure wine. Um, in reality, more than in Kabbalah, like what's going so on. So in reality, wine? in reality, we know for sure that just because of technology of what we know and what we can do with distillation today, with fermentation and distillation and fermentation, not distillation and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff, that our wine today is much stronger than what was back in the days. Ah. Uh, 
Back in the days, wine was thicker. Yes, meaning alcohol percentage. Okay, meaning alcohol percentage for the very sim very simple reason that we are able to extract all of the sugar mm -hmm. from the grapes and turn it with alcoholic fermentation into mm -hmm. alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, and what, that was not possible back in the days because you, you didn't have controlled fermentation. Could have been a viscosity issue rather than yes. alcohol issue? Yes, so it was definitely thicker. Uh -huh. uh, it so could have been darker. More it was definitely sweeter mm -hmm. also. And, and people would drink a lot more. So that's the other thing, all right? People would drink a lot more for the reasons they were talking about, right? Because you would mix it with wine to make to, with water to make water potable. What percentage of alcohol does wine need to have in order to kill the bacteria? And, and I don't know. I think it's enough, like, like four or five percent. <laughs> I think it's enough. Sorry. I think four or five percent is actually question. enough. Seventy percent alcohol. No, I think it. I, I think but you don't need much. I see. You, you actually so don't need safe, much. It, you can, you I can, mean, it's not. You can safely. You know, it's not like hospital water. grade, but it's yeah. better than. So, so see, for example, that the, some cultures, like the Roman Empire, it's, uh, it's considered violence. Yes. So that's the other. Okay. So let me let me answer that. Sorry, let me answer that, that too. The yes. Also say something like I was going. I was going to talk about that. So the second so factor. Sorry. Okay. So the second factor. The second factor has to do with what, well, of course, if you're talking about rabbinic culture. Right, we know that rabbinic culture was influenced by Greco-Roman culture, and Greco-Romans invented basically this thing whereby uh, civilized people mix their wine with water. Mm -hmm. Those who drink it pure are barbarians. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so and so the rabbis have picked up on some of that, which is interesting. But at the same time, the wine that you need for offering has to be pure, has to be straight, right? And so you have that, you have uh, you have that. So one is safer and is more civilized, but the other one is the one that you you use for ritual purposes. So so there is that. Okay, but but mostly it's rhetoric. Uh, the thing about uh, pure wine being too strong, it's its a matter of being civilized and yeah. it's a matter of uh, ideology. It's as simple as if you say it's sweeter and thicker, then it's more pleasant. Mm -hmm. And you're going to drink more of it because it's your primary beverage, then then add water to it. It, may, it makes some sense. Like better to add seltzer, you could make a spritzer, it would be even better. But I don't know when you invent the seltzer. Maybe in San Pellegrino. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, to go back, well, to stay to, into rabbinic literature. So even before all of the sort of Kabbalistic symbolism associated with wine, already in late antiquity in rabbinic culture, wine was associated with secret and with Torah, okay? And uh, I have the sources here, for example, in uh, Shira Shirim Rabbah, in the uh, Midrash on the Song of Songs, uh, you have things like sayings like wine leaves a trace when it is drunk so do the words of torah right so you connect wine with torah or in numbers rabba uh, just as the numerical wine uh, numerical value of yain which is the hebrew for wine is 70 so too torah is 70 faces all right so wine is associated with torah through gematria um, they have the same numerical value and interestingly uh, the idea that torah has 70 faces right means, of course, that Torah is inexhaustible, right? That it's infinite in a sense and, and, and can be dazzling also. Mm -hmm. uh, same text, different passage. When wine enters, knowledge exits. Every time uh, there is wine, there is no knowledge. Uh, okay, I, yes. Um, a little typo here. When wine enters, the secret exits, right? Um, here too, it's interesting to see, I think, that even when you look at this connection between wine, Torah, and secret, you have an ambivalence, right? There's a positive association of wine with Torah, but there's also a, ne a negative association between wine and secret, right? In vino veritas, but sometimes veritas doesn't need to be out in front of everyone, right? Uh, so, all of these sort of uh, explanations about symbols and symbolism, metaphors, 
allows us to go back to my initial research questions, right? And to maybe understand why those research questions, why the research is at all important and or interesting. Well, question number one, the question number two, sorry, which is to say the question about the use of wine in Kabbalistic speculation becomes a question that allows us to tackle Kabbalistic attitudes toward the sexual and religious other. We've talked about that, we mentioned that. Kabbalistic views on the origin of evil, the nature and state of our word, and bodily existence. Okay, wine as being as serving in Kabbalah, for example, as a uh, as an image for the divine blessing, the divine energy, the divine effluence that uh, that uh, that from the infinite God comes down to our word, and how in the process evil also emerges, or how matter. Uh, the material um, emerges, the bodily emerges, and how to engage with that. It also allows us to investigate Kabbalistic stances on esotericism, precisely because of that connection with secrets and secrets of Torah. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, of course, it allows us to investigate the nature and function of Kabbalistic symbols. What does a symbol do in Kabbalah, uh, does it serve only a, what is called a referential or an epistemological function, which is to say, it allows us to learn something about something, or does it also, as scholars have learned now for, for years, also serve what we call a, a performative function, which is to say it allows to actually do things, to tap into that divine reality. Now, question number one then, which is to say looking at the presence of abs or absence and the function of wine in practices allows us to tackle issues uh, that have to do, for example, with the Kabbalistic understandings of the relationships between holy and secular domains. Where can wine can be used on which, um, in which, on which kind of practices and where should it be avoided? Mm? Which is also a question about, uh, about asceticism. Mm? but also Kabbalistic perceptions of the borders that separate or do not separate uh, things that we call today religion or normative religion or regular religion, uh, mysticism, magic, medicine. Okay, examples, all right, so, the focus of my research in terms of time and, what is that? Yes. Okay. In, in terms of time and place is 16th century Tzfat, which uh, apparently you've, uh, you will talk about, you've almost talked about, you will visit uh, soon. And um, so we're talking about, you know, mid 16th century uh, Upper Galilee. We're talking about this Kabbalistic center that flourished uh, as a result of manufacturers. But the bottom line for our, um, for our presentation today is just to know that uh, uh, um, in that time and in that place arrived and uh, wrote and uh, really uh, sort of developed, repackaged and uh, brought and then disseminated new Kabbalistic ideas, a number of authors. And I have, in particular, I have focused my attention on four of them. Uh, Joseph Caro, Solomon Alcabetz, Moses Cordovera and Chaim Vital. Okay. 
So focusing on the res respective stances of wine maintained by those four Kabbalists, uh, I want to give you three examples of the sort of methodology and research ideas that I have laid out until now. So get to some of those results. All right, so the question of esotericism. As we have seen, okay, the idea since the rabbinic association of wine with secret, which is usually couched in negative terms, and a negative connection that is shared also by medieval Kabbalah, for example, in the Zohar, and by Lurianic Kabbalists, right? The idea that revealing secrets is not necessarily a good idea, okay? And therefore, you would imagine that, uh, that, uh, that uh, wine as something that brings about a revelation of secret is, is, uh, is uh, couched in negative terms. Well, it so happens that if you look at the, uh, at the work called Ayelet O'Chavim, uh, essentially a commentary on the Song of Songs authored by al kabetz you encounter, for example, a passage like, the one you have, an exegesis where he's saying, for your love is better than wine. It means the thing hidden and stamped in his intellect in better, is better than his Torah. That is that which is better than the wine, which is the known thing. Like the words of Rabbi Abba in the book of Zohar, Rabbi Abba said, and it's from Zohar 339, wine, oil, honey, water, and milk come from one place. The priests take possession of wine and oil, and oil more than anything, because it conveys joy, both at the beginning and the end. And it is written, it's like a precious uh, oil, et cetera, et cetera. Wine is on the left uh, to raise the voice and sing and not be silent, for wine is never silent. Oil is on the right, wine, however, which causes the voice to be raised and is never silent, come from the side of the mother, Bina, and the Levites take possession of it on the left side, and the role is to raise their voices in song and also to stand in judgment, for it is written, etc., etc. Secret of Torah, to raise secret of Torah, and not, not in its low voice as it is written, and the roof of thy mouth like the, the best wine. Like good wine that is not silent, to raise the voice so as to reveal something to the world. Uh, for your love is better, those are the secrets higher than the known and revealed, and this is from wine. Or he wants to say that it's fitting that they transmit it and let them know, since their good acts are in the likeness of the wine, which is to raise the voices. Okay, long, convoluted, complex passage, but let's try to understand what's, what it's saying. So in the Zohar passage, wine is presented as a liquid that causes one's voice to be raised and to reveal secrets. For this reason, priests whose ritual actions should be kept silent and private in as much as they concern the mystery of promoting the union and drawing blessings, drawing blessings down upon the words, which is to say they're engaged in some sort of Kabbalistic activity that needs to remain secret, must never drink wine before service, right? We mentioned before that priests are forbidden from drinking wine before service, lest they in according to this passage, reveal that secret. However, al kabetz here depicts the symbolic association between wine and revealed word in a decidedly positive manner, in contrast to the more ambivalent attitude displayed in the Zohar, in his source. While in the Zohar, wine as a disclosed secret was not deemed appropriate for temple service, here it represents a secret of Torah that must be transmitted in a loud voice or the good deeds that must be made public. Although concealed things are considered superior, revealed information and secrets symbolized by wine are invariably seen as a positive phenomenon in a number of passages here of Ayelet O'Chavim. So uh, I've broken down some of the kind of some of the exegesis just to kind of uh, maybe clarify things a little bit. So, for example, Al Kabetz translates Kitovim uh, Yain not as for your love is better than wine, oftentimes, but for your love is good as it comes from wine. What does he mean by that? That wine symbolizes divine wisdom which of course symbolizes Torah. 
in another passage that talks about uh, drinking spice wine, this is God saying, I will cause you to drink spice wine and juice of my pomegranate. pomegranate. Al-Kabit says, well, pomegranate juice is esoteric knowledge that comes from, from God, esoteric uh, knowledge. But spice wine is exoteric knowledge, okay? Which is to say it's information of divine origin. That's what he means by spiced or perfumed. Uh, that should be known to all. And that includes things like prophecy or information about the future, okay? So wine is symbolically connected to well-known things that should be revealed. And uh, its origin is benign. Mm. Uh, the last verse there about the roof of your mouth, the roof of the beloved, uh, being like the best wine that glides down smoothly for my beloved, cause, causing the leaves of sleepers to move, right? Wine here again represents the secrets of Torah that must be transmitted in a loud voice or the good deeds that must be made public. So from a passage, well, passages like these, it should become clear that not all Kabbalists active in Sfat uh, ascribed a uh, terrible and dangerous importance to esotericism. Uh, it is certainly recognized by people like Cordovero and it's emphasized by Vital, for example, uh, who underscores the dangers of re revealing secret role, but at the same time is downplayed esotericism by al kabetz who use the disclosure of certain mysteries of Torah, at least with favor. And for example, Braha Saad, who has written a lot on al kabetz and on Cordovero mentions that, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's probably the case that, uh, that uh, uh, the, the idea was that at the time of, the, of redemption, those secrets of Torah shall be disclosed to all, not just to the elite. And perhaps this is a sign that uh, people like al kabetz and other Sabidian Kabbalists were believing that they were living the time of redemption or at the brink of the time of redemption. Okay. Example number two is about asceticism. Okay. And uh, this is against the idea put forward by various scholars that all Kabbalists in Sfat were extreme ascetics. Okay, let me bring item number one and item number two. Item number one is a classic from Joseph Scarrow, a sort of mystical autobiography called Magid Besharim, uh, where there's basically a spirit that, that, uh, that, that uh, admonishes him all the time, telling him, you know, you've did, you did this and you shouldn't have, and you did that and you shouldn't have, and so on. And so, Caro writes things like these. Even if you were required to, to drink wine for your treatment, you should drink it only as the last cup of the meal and not increase from it as you did. Therefore, beware of it from today on. Remember, wine was used in medicine, right? And there is one of the most important commandments that says, you know, if, if your life is at risk, you can take anything. You can take anything, even wine, even non-kosher wine and stuff. And Caro is saying, no, no, no. What you have done is not good as you drank a lot tonight. And even if it was diluted, indeed, through drinking much, you weaken the body. If you always do so and beware of wine, you will be happy in this world and the world to come will be good for you, for you will be a dwelling and a nest for Torah. Again, going against another deep-seated medieval and early modern con con conviction about the fact that wine was a healthy choice was good for your body, generally speaking. Caro is trying to say, absolutely not. What is good is giving it up. Uh, wine actually weakens your body, doesn't strengthen it. And if you, if you give up it, you basically are going to be able to transform your body into something more spiritual, into sort of an empty vessel, which can then inhabit it by Torah, right? Torah as a symbol for the wine that you give up in this case. Do not eat and do not drink for the sake of pleasure, but rather like someone whom a demon has coerced. That is impossible for him, for him to do otherwise for the sustenance of the body. Okay, you have to do it because you have to do it because there's commandments that 
uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, mandate you to drink wine, for example, Friday night, Saturday night, and so on. You do it, but not with pleasure. Again, going against even rabbinic sayings that say, hey, after the destruction of the temple, there's no joy without wine. And so you have to have it at celebration and so on and so forth. Kyrie saying, no, 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 no. You have to have it, but when you must, no joy, no pleasure. And finally, reduce your eating. You do not drink wine except for one glass every night and only very diluted. And even at the time of eating, you shall meditate on my Mishnah and your eating will be considered as sacrifices and offerings in front of the Holy One, blessed be he. So um, I didn't bring the passage, but what's interesting is that Caro, in a different passage, talks about what he considers the bare minimum of eating and drinking. And his bare minimum of drinking is three or four cups, cups of uh, wine mixed with water per meal. Okay, and then here he's saying, no, 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 you don't drink wine except for one glass every night. So clearly what he has in mind is a less than bare minimum amount here, which is the definition of pri privation, of asceticism, of an ascetic posture, right? Of depriving yourself of that which is actually needed. And if you do that, Caro says, then that sort of physical deprivation counts as a sacrifice, as an offering to God, okay? So the offering is not the consumption, but it's the avoidance, okay? Clearly, this is an ascetic posture, okay? Kara was an ascetic, no question about that. But against him... You might say that, that these are admonitions. He's being chastised by the angel. Mm -hmm. And, to, and being told to, to be moderate in his consumption um, and that the passages imply that Carol wasn't uh, wasn't always uh, a very good ascetic. And no, absolutely. He's feeling guilty and, uh, you know, his, the angel that's revealing itself. Oh, completely, him, completely, so completely. On his case about it. But, but again, it, it isn't saying don't drink at all. It's saying... Well, because you can't, right? Because you can't, right? So, I mean, so we'll know, we'll get there. Of course, it's about, if speaking about week, weekday consumption. It's uh, every night. He's speaking about drink a glass of wine every night of the week. That's normal. That's not a problem. Right, but as I mentioned, there's he also gives figures for what is considered normal in his environment. Where though, in in in, in the Beit Yosef and the Shulchan Aruch. No, 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 in the Magid Mesharim. It's just, it's, just a, it's just a passage that I, I didn't bring here, uh, not to clutter it too much, right? So when I mentioned uh -huh. like three or four cups, and also he talks about meat. Mm. He makes but the same example with meat. comparison with, with sex also. Right, right, yes. I mean, this, the statement, for this, don't for the sake of pleasure, but like someone... Right, of course, he, he says the same thing about sex. Gemara, speaking yes. about sex. Yes. So... Okay, so two things to respond to you. Um, one, of course, this is all ideal, right? We're talking about ideology here. We're not talking about actual, uh, you know, actual practice. Um, but the ideology is ascetic for sure. Um, and, and I think there's, there's figures. What's interesting, I think, is that there's, uh, there's actual figures that Caro himself gives about what counts as normal. Mm -hmm. and what is not, mm -hmm. and what he's doing. That's one thing. Um, the other thing is, of course, and, and this is part of the value that I think uh, it is in studying wine and asceticism, right? It, everyone talks about asceticism typically with reference to sex and eating sometimes, but typically sex, right? We know very well that that's something that people lie about all the time also about eating and drinking. But the difference is that with drinking and drinking wine, you can have objective verification because you look at production and consumption, just records for those. With sex, well, you can't, right? And so I think, you know, part of the value of doing this is, is, is to, to, to have another way of talking about asceticism 
which may be it's still kind of ideologically um, uh, marred, if you will, ideologically bent, but 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 you have at least some form of, of objective verification that has to do again with with figures that we have about production and consumption of goods. Oh, okay. I don't know if the figures help us when we're talking about it. You know, by the Sadex and Spot, I mean, Magid is chastising right. Yos yeah, uh, Yosef Taro is not, it's not in the Shulchan Aruch. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not prescriptive for the general Jewish right. public. It's, uh, it's, uh, but we do know the average yeah. consumption. Yeah, we for, do know that. For that, right. But so, again, like the uh, Sadex. All right. So, against this, anyway, against this picture, we have, again, Moses Cordovero, who also has An Hagot, so rules for conduct. Right, again, prescriptive more than descriptive literature. Uh, but interestingly, he says something similar and yet something quite different. For example, what should drink? No wine do, uh, whatsoever during the daytime, but only at night and even then diluted. Only on Sabbaths, festivals, and a new moon may one drink during the day. Fine. Uh, wine endows Samael with strength, right? The idea that Samael is one of the, of the, of the demons, the angels uh, of. Uh, of um, seen and so on and so forth and so you don't want to do that but at the same time then he says meditate upon torah while you drink so that your water and your wine may serve as a drink offering so that's quite interesting because he's basically saying the opposite that caro is saying right while for caro the offering is meditate upon torah while you're not drinking or while you're drinking less than what you should okay uh cordovero is actually um, seems here to anticipate the concept of worship through corporeality that will be later made, developed and made prominent in, in Hasidism. And I'm not the only one who thinks that that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the case. So what does this mean? Well, that uh, contrary to what uh, some scholars have said um, in Sfat, you can see differing assessment of the nature and the state of the word, uh, definitely dominated by sinful forces for Caro, uh, a little bit for Vital too, but really in a fluctuating combination of good and evil powers, according to Cordovero and to all Kabbalists. Mm -hmm. Resulting from these assorted evaluations are the four Kabbalists' varied perspective on material existence, which involve their views concerning the human body and pleasure, decidedly negative in Caro, a bit less so in Vital and ambivalent, yet at least partially favorable in Cordovero and somewhat positive in Alcabets. And these translate into varying degree of asceticism. The most extreme in Caro and still rather pronounced in Chaim Vital, but only ambiguously, I think, present in Cordovero and Alcabets. Last example, holiness, okay? A number of scholars have understood, have uh, labeled Safidian Kabbalah as having an otherworldly orientation, which is to say as having a widespread focus on messianic eschatology, a consequent lack of interest for the contemporary historical and social reality. Others have seen this otherworldly orientation as a displacement and a sublimation of the material and mundane into the spiritual and divine. Basically the idea that Kabbalists in Sfat were not concerned with realia, with the stuff that they had around them. So if we look at Vital and in particular on at his works of practical Kabbalah, Kabbalah Maasit uh, and so on, uh, we can see that he operates essentially on the assumption on the existence and the merit of a secular domain of practice that may and should be kept separate from the sphere of all things holy. And we can see that precisely by looking at how he uses or refuses to use wine in different domains, in different occasions. All right, so when wine is used in ritual and religious practices, it is always seen, it is always viewed as a symbol of the forces of judgment. 
right? Well, the old association with Gvura, which in Vital becomes Dinim, that's the always the association. And that means that it always carries a negative evaluation. Okay, because Vital believes that essentially our word is too full of judgment. And so that that judgment needs to be sweetened. It needs, it needs to be rebalanced. Okay, it needs to be harmonized with something else. Okay, so essentially all ritual and religious activity is construed by Vital in terms of sweetening the judgment. Hmm? And notice how, as we were saying, you know, with, with what uh, Professor Hayut was saying, uh, um, wine cannot be avoided, right? It cannot be avoided for, for religious purposes. One thing is the consumption, you know, when we were talking about you drink one, one glass here, one cup there, but you can't do without it. Hmm? And so this is what happens. We can, this traces in a sense, the contour of what we can call a sacred or a holy domain of action. At the same time, and sometimes in the same texts, or in slightly different texts, but still by Vital, uh, when it comes to technological practice, and by technological practice, I mean things like agriculture, I mean things like uh, medicine, but I also mean things like magic, as we shall see. Vital attributes no symbolic significance whatsoever to wine. He never says, as we would expect, maybe, especially in what we call a Lurianic context, we would expect that uh, uh, because this is the case with food, for example, and also with water in Vital's Kabbalah, in Lurianic Kabbalah, that uh, they would be connected to the Spirot or to the Parzufim or to holy sparks or to holy souls that would need to be redeemed. And so you would think that even sort of casual or at least non-ritual drinking uh, would be involved, would have some sort of religious significance, but this is not the case at all. This is not the case at all. And because of this, wine can be liberally used in agriculture, and Vital talks about viticulture and winemaking. He, for example, um, talks about he mentions various kinds of wine made from either grapes or raisins. He discusses tithes, wine production and handling by non-Jews. He talks about, uh, he distinguishes between wine grapes and table grapes and, and all things like that. Uh, it can also be liber used liberally in medicine. There's a number of uh, medical recipes or, or schulot that, uh, that uh, Vital mentions, but also in magic. And, and Vital and Professor Hayut actually wrote about this, distinguish it quite neatly between mystical formulae and, and, and magical formulae, right? In one you have wine and the other one you don't. Meaning that, again, uh, what counts as there's a, there's, a, there's a whole domain that is secular, that is non-sacred, that involves medicine and magic and other technologies, which is separate from mysticism and religion, and in which, again, uh, one has, has place but has no significance. Because of this, secular drinking is to be avoided. Right, because it has no significance. There's no way that it can take on, as ritual drinking does, take on a religious significance of you know, sweetening the judgment or contributing to uh, the, 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 the betterment of the work. And so better to avoid it because at best it does nothing. At most, well, you, know, you get drunk with somebody else and then you say, uh, so, I mean, is it not possible to frame these in terms of 
uh, wine as a drink and wine as an ingredient. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like in the first, yes. first category, your 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 our, our drink. Anytime you eat or drink in a Luriana context, let's say you're doing uh, yes, but not with wine. But not with wine. Well, that's the my, interesting well, that's thing. My question, though, is is there a play, are there areas in which wine is an ingredient and therefore not a food, and therefore it doesn't right? Like Vital is very interested in technologies of all kinds, right? And, and in astronomy and you name right. it, right? So those and not everything is brought in. You know, it could be in principle. You know, you might expect everything to get a kabbalistic explanation, and it doesn't. It doesn't. But I'm, so what I'm saying is like any any time you're using wine as a drink, it has a symbolic valence or it has a role to play. No, but in those, it, you write about agriculture, medicine, magic. Mm -hmm. I asking you is that though aren't aren't those cases all don't they share in common or relating to wine as an ingredient in a. Well, it is an ingredient in medicine and magic, but it's not an ingredient if you're making it. But if you're right, making it, it's not the same as consuming it either. So there's right. a drink. You know what I mean? You're not well, drinking it when you're making it. You're making it, you're using it as an ingredient. And these are, it's, this isn't really but, about but, drinking but, it but, but then he also talks about avoiding it for drinking and, and secular drinking. So, so it okay. does make the difference. Okay. It does make the difference. What do you refer to by use the wine culture? Well, the, 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 the winemaker, viticulture and winemaking. So all the so kind production. of- Production. Yes, production, production, and yes, not consumption, production. Um, as I was mentioning, right? Different kinds of wine and how to make it and how to type it and you know, how to use uh, you know, non-Jews or Jews to make it and all that kind of stuff and which grapes to use and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay, so um, so the diverse conception, uh, so, so I think what, what, uh, what this passage, um, this last point proves is that the, um, also in spot they were diverse conception of the relationship between sacred and so, non-sacred realms which range from Caro's call from, for an all-encompassing symbolization of one's action, resulting in a negation of the secular, to Cordovero's almost exclusive focus on the socio-religious sphere and his effort to extend its scope to the secular by sanctifying the mundane, to Vital's acknowledgement of the existence and merit of a secular realm of practice to be kept separate from the sphere of all things holy. Okay? So analyzing these four Kabbalist attitudes toward wine enables us not only to refine our understanding of their individual thought overall, but also to produce, I think, a more complex and nuanced picture of Sephidian Kabbalah, which challenges certain scholarly generalizations, usually stemming, I suspect, from collapsing into Lurianism, all Kabbalistic teachings produced in Sfat. And generalization, for example, about its participants sweeping asceticism, their otherworldly orientation, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I certainly have some questions, but I don't want to be, I don't want to continue being obnoxious. <laughs> I'll take an obnoxious break and let some others. How, how do I, okay, maybe I should stop sharing. Uh, the screen, yeah, let's, yeah, why don't you stop, we can always reshare it. it okay, be. here I am. Yeah, does anyone have a question? Also, the Zoomers can, can ask a question. I'll start. Uh, many thanks, for being. I learned a lot. Uh, and also, as you were talking, uh, challenged me to think always in comparative manner. Now, during the, about things I know more about than Kabbalah. Now, the first half of the talk was less of a challenge. Many of the things you said, uh, I could imagine, uh, recognize, identify in other cultures. Sure. Christian, pagan. Um, and we saw that as soon as we started talking about the diluted wine and how here it's barbarous, here there's maybe a deeper significance, but one can relate to that. But if we are going 
more specifically in the second part of the lecture, in the example of it, and this philosophical uh, discussion of the various um, significance of them. I wonder if you can do that as well. This I do not know how to do, but thinking about the historical context. Yes. And wonder about, for example, um, Islamic rationalization against wine, or what is good and what and bad in Christian asceticism, etc. Is this any useful way of thinking? Yeah. So I think so. That that is some work that some scholars have begun to do recently, and uh, I think that uh, I have uh, you know I didn't want to go there necessarily uh, for this presentation, uh, but um, I have. Uh, I can hint, gesture towards at least a couple of ideas. One, for example, uh, well, one thing that, that, that we have to keep in mind, which has been, again, noted by some scholars, is that a lot of these Kabbalists either were of converso background or had an audience of conversos, right? So we're talking about communities of Jews who had lived as Christians, sometimes for generations. And so I, I can bring a couple of examples from Cordovero and from Vital, where they talk about, for example, Cordovero talks about the importance of uh, the value, the extreme, the, 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 the enormous value of drinking and keeping wine kosher. And if you do that, and if you do that, you earn a place in the world to come. Now, how hard could have been for the average Jew in Sfat in the mid 16th century to keep wine kosher? Not terribly hard, I think, right? Well, because in theory, Muslims around who are the majority are not drinking, in theory. And uh, Christians are no longer considered idolaters, and, and you know there, there are some, you know, they, they do their, their own thing and so on and so forth. To me, that is a strategic effort that Cordovero puts in front of his audience to say, hey, you all know that wine has a salvific value. Right, as Christians, as former Christians, you know that wine has a salvific value. It's a Eucharist, right? It's the blood of Jesus. And you partake of it and you're saved. And now I'm giving you basically the same strategy to do it and become and be saved as Jews. So that's one example where I think looking comparatively can, can uh, looking at, at cultures, at other cultures, non Jewish cultures can help. There's another example in a text by Vital, which uh, deals with wine and blood. Now, I can't remember the exact details now off the top of my head, but I also, I, in, the, you know, in, in my research, uh, I've suggested that uh, what Vital is doing with the text about the ritual use of wine uh, as a substitute for blood and as a positive substitute for blood where blood has a negative symbolic value is a gesture against a nod to that converso audience, their familiarity with the Eucharist, their familiarity with the connection between wine and blood and the, and the idea. And, 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 and in a sense, Vital uh, knows that and is responding to it. Um, there may be also connections with the Muslim environment around, in part uh, for all the seriousness that they seem to put on these kosher wines, they seem to be not bothered very much about drinking with Muslims. There's a certain, Shaul Magid talked about certain porosity of the borders between Jews and, and, and Muslims, it's fat. Uh, and that may have to do precisely you know, with the fact that, 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 that uh, wine has no ritual use in Islam, right? 
um, there may be in the Ilian Hagot by Cordovero that I, that I brought as a text, there's something about not drinking wine at night. So I'm wondering all oh, there too, you know, we, which if there's any, any connection there with the idea of Ramadan, uh, but that's, uh, that's more speculation than anything else. So, so, so I think there, there, there are some places where you can, you can think about those sort of uh, appropriation, strategic appropriation, especially I think of Christian themes and the response to that, like a Jewish response to that. Yeah. Question? Uh, yes. But there's also someone in the chat. Oh, okay. Maybe. How does that work? Um, he has to unmute himself. Okay. You have to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, I don't know if we can hear. That's a no, I heard somebody before. Let me see. Can you hear me? This is Max. Yeah. Dylan, can you try talking? Can you hear me? He is trying to talk. Maybe you could send your question in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure why we're not, not able to hear you. Yeah, but maybe there is something about, I think she was saying something about microphones. I'm not sure. Uh, but if you send it in the chat, maybe we'll be able to read it aloud. Yeah. Uh, maybe some more, you'll find the chat. I don't know where the chat, check under here perhaps. No, I'm thinking about- Oh, selected speakers. That's right. That's a one. microphone. That's microphone. This one? Well, that just seems like okay. the same option. Okay, yeah. Okay, so let's just uh, type it. Oh, now he's gone. He's gone. He's gone. I don't see that oh. either. Chat. Let's see if anything happens okay. there. All right. Well, maybe would you like to, in the meantime, in the meantime, perhaps it's yeah. Oh, sure. While we wait. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was just texting also with Dylan. Uh -huh. so, uh, so, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for this great presentation. I, I have a more general question, thinking and comparing in my mind to Christianity. Um, to, to what extent do they speak about the negative and positive holds together in the same passage? Yes, a lot. Quite of a bit. So do you, do you think that it actually both have to be together, like the harmonious paradox that Byron speaks about. Do mm -hmm. you see that in Judaism as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think in discourses, Kabbalistic discourses about wine, it's, um, um, and, and not only, probably also rabbinic uh, discourses about wine, you don't, you always have that dichotomy and you can't do without that dichotomy. And, and actually there are, passages in both rabbinic literature and Kabbalistic literature where the representation of wine is one-sidedly positive, mm -hmm. you can tell they're not talking about wine. They're not talking about real wine. They're talking about Torah mm -hmm. as a metaphor for wine. And they say it because they, oftentimes they associate it with a different sphira, with bina and not mm -hmm. with, uh, so with a kind of a higher, less ambivalent um, uh, um, Kabbalistic entity, divine entity. And, uh, and the association, the ultimate connection is always with Torah. So, 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 so almost invariably when you have, especially the exception is sometimes commentaries on the, um, uh, on the Song of Songs because the text itself is very positive about, typically is very, speaks very positively about wine. And so you, you can't really force the text to say anything too negative about it, okay? But if you look at the Zohar, if you look at uh, uh, Safinian Kabbalah, you always have, you know, this, this contrast between the two. And that's, that's, I would say that's inherent in the sort of the symbolic structure why that's why they use wine precisely because they want something that can keep together those opposites oh, wow. and that's why it works for example to explain how you get from the perfect infinite divine to the imperfect finding word but it's not that you get to the divine 
Let's see if we can get Dylan when he jumps back in. Dylan, All right. You want to see connected? He's connected to the audio. Let's see. Dylan. Can All you right. speak? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. No, no, we can't okay. hear. Can you? How about you call me? Uh, it's either that or you can type your question. Yes. Outside that. In the meantime, I, I'd like to you know, be obnoxious again. Okay. So, uh, well, he's here now. Oh, he's here. Okay. Go for it. No. We can talk? He's typing. Oh, it's oh, it's you can't hear me, right? No. Um, all right. Okay, yes. Yes. Uh, there's a widespread connection in Greco Roman thought between unmixed wine and madness. Does that come up? Um, the, the, the madness, not really, but as I said, there's a, typically there's a, a negative connotation associated with pure wine uh, as being um, intoxicating. And as I mentioned, one of the connotation is that it's associated with this, uh, with, with this sort of, of uh, uncontrolled female power which uh, while, while, you know, mixed wine is, is a, good, um, a good pairing, a good coupling of masculine water and, and feminine wine. And so there's, there's, uh, there's something that's, uh, that's controlling and balancing and, and harmonizing. Um, the madness, not so much, but definitely the intoxication, the intoxication that, that, uh, that comes with, with, uh, with pure wine, the idea that it, it takes you to places uh, mentally that you cannot, um, you cannot withstand, places that you cannot bear. So for example, there's a, uh, there's a uh, the, the, sometimes it's connected to the famous story of the four sages who are entering the Pardes, who are entering the garden of uh, esoteric knowledge and uh, and that story is associated with the um, biblical story in Leviticus of the sons of the priest Aaron who enter into the tent of meeting uh, and, uh, and and basically die. And so the idea is that they were drunk, and the Kabbalistic interpretation of that is that they were drinking good wine but also bad wine it doesn't say if it's pure or mixed but they were drinking wine in order to enter into those secrets right i mentioned the connection between wine and secret and that wine basically drove them which is to say that esoteric knowledge was too much for them to bear okay so it's about the dangers of everything but it's not I mean, it's not quite as madness and and the rhetoric is not about the pure wine versus mixed wine it's about Good wine and bad wine. Okay, so it's uh, it's a little different. Is there, is there a recognition in the uh, Dionysian uh, uh, celebrations in from the Greco Roman period? Is there is there in, in terms of just like the full blown Greeks Dionysian uh, um, uh, celebration? Um, is it, is, it, is it recognized in the literature? Well? There's a, so there's never, if, if by that you mean a sort of enthusiastic celebration of the wine drinking, of the ritual wine drinking, I would have to say no. Uh, the ritual space is not dry, cannot be dry, right? You have to use wine in the ritual space but it's never intoxicated. It's never drunk. Well, with, with so to cups. say, well, well the, the only exception, the real exception is Purim. Also the four cups of the Seder. The four cups of the Seder, but they're interpreted in a, in a different way. They're interpreted right. typically theurgically. 
Uh, no, but I mean, re in reality, if you drink four glasses well, of wine, you're going to get We're talking about, you know, we're talking about the... No, but I mean, in the Gemara, they know that people were yes. feeling sick for yes. days after the Seder. Yes. Experience, so... so yeah, kind of so there is a, but there is a, but there is a, so, okay. And but, the house of so, the mourner. There is, yes. So there is an acceptance, I think. There is an acknowledgement in certain sources, and, and, and Professor Hayes is talking about less about Kabbalistic sources, right. more about rabbinic sources. Right. Uh, there is an acknowledgement right. that drunkenness can happen. Sure. And it can happen as a result of performing certain rituals or, or of, of, of abiding by certain commandments, uh, you know, like at Passover, like at Purim, and so on and so forth. But that form of drunkenness is not construed as enthusiasm, as positive enthusiasm, typically. Except on Purim. Except on Purim, where you have, and I didn't bring it here, but I have it, you know the text as well, Chaim Vital has this almost uh, uh, antinomian text about uh, drinking, how you can, how by, by getting intoxicated on Purim, you can actually perform some sort of redemption of uh, divine sparks that you could not get at if you were sober. But at the same time, your intention should be in another place. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complex operation for sure. Did you ever, have, did you ever see there's a, a supplement to the kiddush of the first glass of wine? At the Seder, that uh, Saadia apparently. Yes, you gave me a photocopy of that I with uh, with uh, oh, with uh, okay. with uh, with wine stains. Yeah, yes. I have it somewhere in my office. Copy. Yes, you so gave it to me many years ago. It is a, it's, it's close to a, a Dionysian celebration yes. of wine, as you're likely to find in a Jewish source. And it was expunged from. And in fact, it was expunged yeah, it was from much. the <laughs> from the ritual already in the ten, in the tenth century. <laughs> so we, we have just a few more minutes. There's a question in the chat. Okay, question in the chat. Okay, okay. within the same term of dual theme of dualism, does anyone talk about using wine as a way to access the other part of the realm of Sitra Acha? So that is actually one of the risks, right? Because access to the Sitra Acha, access to the sort of the demonic realm, uh, can happen through malchut, but more often than not, happens through gvura, so through that excess of judgment, the ex excess, excess of uh, the, the sort of, of um, overflow of divine judgment, uh, which is represented precisely by gvura, by, by that, which is the, the divine attribute that uh, wine tends to symbolize. And so uh, that is precisely all the discourse about uh, cautioning the fact that uh, wine can be gladdening but can also be intoxicating and the moment it becomes intoxicating uh, that that that's the representation of uh, uh, sliding slipping into the demonic and then it becomes also associated with uh, impure blood with all sorts of other uh, sometimes in, uh, for example, in Cordovero, it's um, uh, the, 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 the Sitracha is especially associated with the dregs or the lees of the wine. Remember that wine was unfiltered and so it was thick and those, those kind of particles that uh, would remain there, those, those were sort of the visible reminder of those thick shells, those um, things that, that remain attached to you. So, so yeah, so there is, there is some of that, but again, always in the negative. So, so if I may, okay. okay. So the first thing I just wanted to say for the sake of the students, some, um, that it's, uh, it, it's worth mentioning uh, something that's so maybe so Presu presumed knowledge that you didn't you didn't mention it, but okay. it's uh, like in the in the realm of Jewish law that treats foods, what we think of as kosher laws. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, wine is the exception in, insofar as the determination of its uh, its uh, being kosher or not. It has nothing to do with any ingredient in it. It's more like, uh, I don't know, like, it makes uh, it. 
but you see like if you when you go to India or something you know you stay with a Brahmin family they may give you a different set of dishes because they don't want you to touch their dishes and it's it's about uh, purity and impurity and you know, de 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 potential defilement of something to which impurity can become attached it's not a it's not an ingredient issue. All of Jewish food laws have to do with the presence or lack thereof of certain ingredients. And so kosher supervision has to do with the rabbi certifying that all the ingredients were okay. So in, in wine, That's not the case. All, it's always the same wine. It only has to do with its, with its production and with the, and with the presumption that because it can be offered as a libation to an idol, that it, it has a kind of spiritual susceptibility or sensitivity. Um, and, and once it has, you know, once it's someone has considered offering it as a libation to an idol, it, it's, it becomes an approach unfit for uh, consumption by, yes. by Jews. But it's it's the question of its fitness for consumption is unrelated to its. It, how right. it works there is a, the yeah. ingredients. Yes. So that's kind of just not relating to Kabbalah at all, but, but it shows you that in Jewish law, it's different. That wine is unique. different, and it already has this kind of uh, spiritual sensitivity. It has a quality right. that doesn't, isn't found in any other. Right substance and there's and there's part part of it you know has to do i mean there are some restrictions on ingredients right for example you can't use uh clarifying agents that are that are um like from lard or something well not only lard, that probably. but even uh, one thing that you that that uh, back in the days people used to um uh to purify wine was egg white Mm -hmm. Right, and if you put if you do that with egg white, well, it's not kosher, right? Because mm -hmm. the egg would have been would should 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 be controlled, certified, mm -hmm. and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, and so it's not used. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a tiny part of that that has to do with ingredients, mm -hmm. but it's non-relevant. It's irrelevant right, right. in that sense. So, uh, yeah. The other thing is that there's a there's a a a recognition that wine is something that's alive. I mean, pure wine is called wine high. Yain Chai, mm, it's mm. Li living wine. And because of that, because it's living, then it can change and people can libate it, can contaminate it. In fact, in order to make a wine that is kosher and that it stays kosher, even if a non-Jew touches it, mm. what do you do? What do you do? You kill it, right? You cook it. It's called mevushal in Hebrew, right? You cook it, which Basically, you, you boil it, and at that point, it's no longer alive. It's, it's also dead. not fit for ritual use uh, and, in the temple. Yes. It's interestingly, right, it can be served, but you can no longer use it. You in can temple. drink it as a beverage, but you yes. can't use it ritually yes. in a... In a right, in a which is very interesting. So, so that's, that's, that's his idea. It has to be alive where with all the risks there? and benefits. Where is that? Where... From uh, from oh, from from rabbinic Jewish law from rabbinic you know, literature. Yeah. Yes. yes. Specifically refers to wine as a It's it's called it's pure wine. It's yain chai, which means living wine. So yeah. I mean, there's several degrees of life. There's a whole. I can I can point you to sources. There's uh, there's there's there's, no, there's a lot of different categories. No, yes, I'm, there's a lot of different categories. I'm very interested in. And there's. We can touch or we can open. Don't say we first of all. No, it's not. Non-Jew non yeah. can touch or can open. Uh, you cannot pour it. Yes. You can touch. I think you can touch. The whole thing is ridiculous. The way it's yes. handled by contemporary. The contemporary rabbinate in Israel is ridiculous because, as Vadim mentioned in his lecture, a thousand years ago the rabbis determined that Christians were not idolaters. They always knew, said that Muslims are not idolaters, and in fact they made very wide-ranging statements about how the fact that idolatry as such doesn't even exist anymore. So to say that we need to be worried about a Gentile or a non-religious Jew looking at wine and making it it's not uh, even it's not even non-Jews now. It's also non yeah, not I mean, enough observant it's Jews. Jewish, it's, Jewish law. it's a completely sociological, political uh, kind of uh, pathology of contemporary orthodoxy. That's not my opinion, of course. But 
<laughs> but um, but anyway. it also affects the non-Jew to be careful of right. That. But yes. The, the problem here is like my, my, my concern is it not to touch or not to open. So neither of them is an issue. It's just if you might find some Jews Orthodox are. rabbi saying, "No, hey, you can't. you're not you. Yeah. I don't know who you are. Don't look at it. Don't touch it. Don't do." But uh, I think the main. I think the main. Them, Bring me the source. Show me where it says that in the short room. So the main source. the main concern open though is is opening the bottle and pouring it. Up. Opening the bottle and pouring it. I think if you touch the bottle, but the bottle is sealed, if an idolater it's fine. does it, but you know, that's what I want to should be emphasized here. If an right. idolater does it, then in Jewish law, that's a problem. Right. No, no, but I'm talking about idolaters around. So what's the problem? But there's a there's a different. So, it's not my thinking. It's there's Jewish a there's a there's a, there's a difference between a sealed container mm -hmm. and an unsealed container. I think that's, that's where where Jewish that's where law. the trick it's is. A thousand years. I am not legal. D decisions that are uh, documented and be before the modern explosion of uh, humrot and making things more and more strict, where they, these strictures have no foundation in the history of Jewish law. I don't right. know. I don't know that. I always say that. She's saying, like today, in, in like if you go to uh, a restaurant or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's say you're an Orthodox person. You go to a restaurant. You order a bottle of wine. So. The, so the rabbi who's running the kosher certification of the restaurant, if there's an Arab waiter, they'll say, Arab waiter, don't bring that wine to the table. We need to get a Jew with a yarmulke on his head to bring the wine to the table. Otherwise, the wine will be ruined. Mm -hmm. And I say, there's no basis for that in, in Jewish history. law. Uh, in the history of Jewish law, a thousand years since we have been talking about it, this right. is a modern, hypernomian yeah. aberration. That now people seem to think is actually Jewish law. It's not. <laughs> but but in Jewish law, and that's in the Mishnah already, there is a difference between a sealed container and a non-sealed container. So you could apply that in theory yes. to the bottle. So if you open the bottle and pour it, that's a problem. If you handle the bottle, but the bottle is sealed, that's probably okay. If you're an adult. <laughs> that's <laughs> probably that's probably okay. I no. am not. Uh, Jewish law is not my strength, so but but I think that 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 would be my line of reasoning. I would suspect. I would only, and now we really have to end it. And it was great, and thank you for giving us even that overtime. And my and we can. I would like to talk to you more, sure, in, in, in privately. But my only kind of critical reflection on the four Sephardian mm -hmm. tablets is that um, you know I I would. I, I think that it's important to be very conscious of the distinctive sources from which you are taking your evidence and the nature of those sources and the way the genre of, mm -hmm. you know, Al, you quoted from Alcabetz was a commentary, I think, on the Song of Songs. Right. And a, Cordovero was the, the pietistic practices for a brotherhood, and Caro was the the dictation from an angelic right. revelatory being, mm -hmm. and Vital was an, an, an a magical magical and alchemical notebook. Now, you know, each those are very different sources, and I think that um, the nature of the sources and the nature of the genre has to be taken into consideration. I also think that, you know, you, um, that to, to me, like you, you were, you're, were pushing towards uh, a, like more, uh, like this one is more ascetic, this one is less ascetic. I think some of those, the attempts to do that kind of miyun, how do you say in English, uh, a triage, I don't know, mm -hmm. of the sources. This is like this, this is going to be complicated both by the by the my previous comment, but but also, you know, what, even in the sources that you had used, I I read ambivalence in all of them, mm -hmm. and that and it's an ambivalence that's shared with some of the the things with, with which wine is so often coupled, as we saw, sex and. Um, uh, you know, whatever, um, there were some, uh, so, uh, and secrets was the other thing I wanted to say, mm -hmm. like, 
is the revelation of secrets good or is it bad? Now, Chaim Vital says, oh, you know, my theory died because he revealed the secret. But who begged him to reveal the secret until he couldn't resist? It was Chaim Vital, right? So right. Well, and then like, he published it. So, so, <laughs> so like, the, the, the ambivalence to me is, is, is what so, is so prominent. Um, and it's an ambivalence that make, in a way, it makes sense because that is, you know, it's, it's intoxication, it's an anesthesia, it's the portal to another, another kind of experience of reality. Um, you know, it has this, it'll, it'll you know, oh, oh, uh, enlighten you and, and, uh, and kill you. It, like in the case of Nadav and Abihu, and, they, mm -hmm. and you don't, is Bikidoshai uh, Kadesh, like what God says in the Bible there, when the sons of Aaron die, he says, I'll be sanctified right. by, those who are closest to me. So, but then, the, but so they drank wine and they became close, but they died. So it's, it's, I would go, I would, I would, I don't think that you need to make it so like who this one is against that one. But I think you can get, I don't know, I think that, that, that you are in favor of a nuanced reading, but I think that, that like, um, I don't know, the nuance may be may not be in, in the classification of different attitudes towards it, but in seeing how it, you know, how it plays out in the different genres and in the different, for different audiences, and also hal halachic work, uh, ma magical work, how they're all coming at this from different angles, but the, the the, the one common denominator is the wine with right. its magical qualities. Yeah. I, I think that would be a, a way around it. I very much appreciate this comment. And I think if you, if you focus it on the material, the wine, that can both in a book or whatnot account for the different genres and get uh, the, the common pattern in this. Uh, I, I, that's something I wanted to ask you, but I think there is not a complete answer to it. If you if you would think more from the perspective of how do they experience this line and how therefore does it shape their opinions? But again, it's <laughs> all right. I don't know if I you no, want me to no, answer no, as part no, of uh, no. you want me to respond to that as part of, of our well, conversation. No, no, no. So yeah. So now. yeah, yeah. No. So a couple of things. I, I appreciate the comment. I, I I appreciate the the, the the critical comment. And and you know and and I can take part of your point uh, for sure. So in my research, well, a couple of things. So first of all, for the sake of presentation and of you know giving examples that are exemplary, that are clear right. and clear cut. Uh, you know, I made a selection of stuff that I think, you know, conveys the point in the yeah. clearest possible manner. And, and of course, at the expense of nuance and in, precisely at the expense of ambivalence. Uh, so the reset, uh, as it turns out, it turned out that, uh, yes, I have, uh, I ended up uh, work basically giving you examples from, from, from text uh, which belong to very different genres. And so also different audiences and so on and so forth. Um, I would say, however, that while for, so that the, 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 the specific focus is on Kabbalistic literature. So of course, Karo wrote a Shulchan Aruch, but I, I am not gonna, I'm not gonna go there. Uh, that's, that's a choice of just limiting the corpus and also limiting also the material to what, uh, I am able as a scholar to handle. Um, and, uh, um, and, uh, and, uh, and with al Kabetz, sure, you know, the, 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 it is true that the only work that I've actually looked at for al Kabetz is the uh, commentary on, on, on the Song of Songs, uh, the Ayelet al Chavim, and, and I have, um, I've actually mentioned, and I think I've mentioned also in some comments that of course, some of what he's writing there may be skewed because it's commenting on a text that in and of itself has a positive evaluation of wine overall and so on of love of other things. And so it's imposing its own textual limitations on, on, on discourse. 
That's for sure. Now, when it comes to Cordovero and Vital, however, um, again, it so happened that, that, uh, that the textual uh, samples that I brought come from a particular sector, um, but it, actually I have analyzed like the entire corpus. Okay. And so certain kinds of texts, I think, are more useful for, to make certain kinds of points, right? If we were to talk about, for example, Cordovero's sim conception of Kabbalistic symbol, I would have brought material from Oriakar and from Perdes Irmonim and from other things. Okay. okay. Same thing for Vital. If we were talking about, say, ritual, I would have brought uh, stuff from, you know, Pri Etz Chaim and Etz Chaim and Sharia uh, Kavanot and all that kind of stuff. So, so I think there's, there's, there's part of uh, that. Now, the ambivalence part. The I think I've made it clear, I mean, pro programmatically, that ambivalence is built into wine and precisely, and wine works so interestingly, I think, and so effectively also as a symbol and in ritual, precisely because ambivalence is built in it. Uh, and, uh, you know, even the title, you know, Wine Enters Secret Exit, well, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It, can be read, as I mentioned, for example, with the al Qaeda sex as a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so on and so forth. So I recognize the ambivalence. Ambivalence, I think it, it is the, 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 uh, the you know, the fil rouge of the whole thing. But at the same time, I am not content with just a blanket statement of saying, oh yeah, it's all ambivalence. Yeah. Because that, for example, has been a lot of the rhetoric, for example, about the study of the Zohar and the study of the Zohar and a number of themes, it's okay, it's a middle list, just this and this that. And of course, a lot of these Kabbalists were commenting on the Zohar, and so of course they also say there's this and this that. Right. But if you look and you compare the text, yeah. right, for example, Cordovero has the same exact uh, comments on the same exact passage of the Zohar, 339a, which I brought from al mm -hmm. and goes in a different direction. And basically is much more ambivalent in his reading of the whole thing about revealing secrets. He said, ah, oh, that's like not such a good thing. Doesn't... So, so you have sometimes, mm -hmm. if you look, I think, uh, carefully enough, people commenting on the same text or people interpreting the same text that is ambivalent as a source, but they take a different direction. So I think that you, you can make some of those distinctions. And I think that some of those distinctions are useful. And I also think that, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, I didn't want to do name dropping, but some of those distinctions, some of those nuances, which I tried to push, <coughs> are shared by other colleagues of ours against maybe older, an older generation of scholars or, or somebody else. So I think that there is a, there is a, um, you know, there is, there is a, there is a value in, uh, saying, sure, there's ambivalence, but, but, but it's not all the same. It's not all the same. Um, and uh, the, the last example that I wanna make about that is an example which, uh, you know, going back to my roots of an Italian Kabbalist, Rabbi Menachem Mazari of Fano, who was famously a, late 16th, early 17th century Kabbalist, who basically took, got from Tzfat, a number of manuscripts of the classics of Cordovero and Vital. They arrived in Italy and he printed. And he was one of those who kind of was, and he wrote commentaries on them. So if you look, for example, at the commentaries on Pardes Rimonim and on some of Vital's work, uh, no, Vital's work. I think Vital. Yes, I think there's a, there's a, yeah, I think so. There's a, there's a passage from Etz I think. Anyway, that, uh, that, 
that um, that Menachem Azario Fano copies, transcribes, and comments. One of the things that he does when it comes to wine, he removes almost all of the negative connotations. Mm -hmm. Everything becomes all of all. Whenever he talks about wine, it's all good. I think that's, of course, it's La Dolce Vita, right? I think that's significant. And even that is something that we should study, that we should acknowledge and try to make sense of. For example, what I suggest, because I think it's quite systematic in the work that he does, I've suggested something that I wrote in Italian some years ago, that uh, the relationships between Italian Jews and Italian non-Jews in that uh, in, in, in Fano's environment were such that, uh, you know, he could be a little less uh, stringent about using wine as a tool of kind of separation between Jew and Jews and non-Jews. And because of that, he removed all of these kind of terrifying images, I think. So, so... The town didn't bring a good spirit from Calabria. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> uh, so, so that's that's my that's my. Uh, again, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Let me let me say I'm not content with just saying yes. There's ambivalence, of course. Ambivalence is structural in what but, we're doing, but I'm not happy not with just leaving white. it at that. It's not black and white because the, you can. Yes. Either you say nuance means that either you you can see. Without dividing people into opposing camps, you know. Right. So well, they, it, again, it's not. You know. it, it's a little more. Right. It's it's not as neat as that. But but I think that there's there's some places also, where you can it finds ex expression in different ways in different authors. So like it's not ambivalence isn't also one thing. Right. You know I mean, it has it's right. It's, and so, and so that's, that's where I think that, that yeah. you could, you could have at least different shades. On yeah. The yeah. Okay. Let's put yes. it that way. Yes. If you like that like better. That yeah. shades of we'll go with shades, uh, different shades, shades of, of ambivalence. ambivalence. Okay. Well, I want to right. thank you so much. Let me let in uh, one more guest here.